Thank you, Candice. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today uh, to be a respondent to our panelists uh, because in a way um, today's events and of course the exhibition itself does something that I have to describe in French because I've never found a good way to describe it in English. Mais ça boucle le boucle, la boucle. So it, it completes a, a kind of a loop for me uh, which began before Land Spirit Power in fact and that has to do with my own engagement with indigenous art. Um, although I, I walked up here with papers, I really I don't have anything prepared because, of course, the role of a respondent isn't so much to prepare his or her own paper as to um, respond to the questions that are raised by the panelists. The first thing I want to say is that I'm very struck by the absolute distinctiveness of each of the panelists, what they had to say, their particular voices. And yet I'm also struck by the way that each one of their talks, in a certain sense, could be said to illustrate the others. We find recurring uh, ideas, uh, but we also find shifting perspectives, which I think is important for all of us. Um, I'm going to in the first place, um, go through and mention a few things that struck me in each of the panelists' uh, talks in order, because I think that when we read them as, as listeners in order, uh, we see a perspective that starts off with Gerald Wisner's talk, very broad, extraordinarily comprehensive, going incredibly far back in time to the uh, cavern paintings 30,000 years ago, and then zooms in to uh, the microcosmic perspective of Venkat uh, and his intensely personal narrative drawings. I was very interested in reading, uh, because I did have the opportunity to read the papers beforehand, thank God. <laughs> Um, and uh, <laughs> no, seriously, um, uh, and, uh, reading Gerald's paper and then listening to it again, um, he begins with, a co with some concepts that I think are you know, critical and so in a sense I, I can resume, I think, what he had to say in, in very few but important words. Um, the concept of transmotion which he defines as the inspired evolution of cosmo-totemic natural motion of memory and cultural survivance. So for me, coming to these ideas from the outside, I found myself thinking, whoa, how do we define cosmo-totemic and survivance? And uh, survivance um, is a cross between, as it sounds, as a cross between survival and resistance. And Gerald, you use it uh, to uh, replace survival, to show that it's an ongoing uh, changing process. I'm going to take a stab myself at Cosmo Totemic. Um, it combines the vastness, embracing inclusiveness of the cosmos, the world, with the tentacular strands of the totemic, which stretch out and carry the ever-changing particularities of relationships that fill and float through the universe. I, I was very struck by your, by your emphasis in your paper on motion, on what you call natural motion, and you illustrate that by talking about um, Adair's film and, and walking. Um, but this notion, this very fluid notion of motion, uh, made me think of other kinds of motions, which are perhaps, although natural motion, of course, exists for all of us, if we pay attention to it, um, but I was thinking of other kinds of motions as well. Uh, for example, the sort of cyclical, closed system, bureaucratic motion that takes place in many institutions, and which is one of the things that makes them so hard to break into uh, if you're on the outside, or if you have a question for them that they're not set up to answer. I was also thinking about trade routes and how trade routes from time immemorial have connected us because we needed things that others had. Um, for example, indigenous people in Canada in the area around the Great Lakes 
traveled along the waterway of the Mississippi, et cetera, all the way down to the Florida Panhandle because they needed uh, some of that beautiful uh, mica that was found down there. Um, and vice versa, uh, the people in the Florida Panhandle want some of that copper uh, that was up in the Great Lakes area. So there are things like that that bring us together. Then there are migrations which happen for all kinds of reasons. We human beings are incredibly mobile. Um, if we can't change our environment, we change our location. Um, and one of those kinds of migrations that looms very large in the perspective of any uh, discussion of indigeneity and particularly an exhibition about uh, global indigenous art is colonization. Another kind of migration where power relations uh, enter in uh, to the, the question so that we have, um, we have, um, um, Instead of relations between equals, we have the ability for certain groups to control the narrative. And I think that this controlling the narrative is one of the things that an exhibition like Sakahan is about. That is to say, it's about survivance in the sense of resisting uh, that narrative control and introducing other versions. So if we move from Gerald's paper to Megan's, um, I thought that one of the uh, really interesting thing about, things about Megan's um, perspective is just how much, Megan, your curatorial perspective resembles my curatorial perspective. In fact, probably resembles most curatorial perspectives in the sense that uh, we become very deeply engaged in the work of the artists who interest us, for our own personal, but also cultural and political reasons. And we, we burrow into that work um, and we talk about it. Um, but as I said to Megan last night, um, quoting uh, one of my mentors, um, in name only, I've never met him, but I've only, I've read him, uh, the Swiss curator Thomas Amann, um, um, Jean-Christophe, confusion there, a man, definitely, um, who said that what curators do is to create a spiritual horizon, and we do that by the way that we place uh, a group of works of art in a room or a sequence of works of art in a series of rooms. And this, to me, seems incredibly uh, revealing. I do, however, also want to pick out some of the concepts that Megan introduced because they're very important, I think. You talked a lot about Hauteris uh, as the first uh, uh, Maori modernist or one of the first and the way that that modernism meant uh, insisting on the individual rather than the collective and the ability to, but, but yet with the ability to integrate Maori concepts. It's difficult to find a better definition of the sort of hybridity that runs all through this exhibition, I think. I was also interested by your emphasis on place, on iwi, which I understand to mean tribe or people or nation, um, and therefore on cultural specificity, um, which I think, um, maybe I'm going to go back a little bit. You know, um, artists have come to the West for a long time. This isn't a new phenomenon. This kind of specifically artistic travel uh, to find new sources, to make new connections, uh, to bring back new ideas uh, has been going on uh, for quite a while. And certainly in the 20th century, many of the artists who did that uh, up to and including the couple of decades after the Second World War, um, embraced a vocabulary of, of uh, international abstraction, for example, or of surrealism, two kinds of languages that seem to be universally uh, applicable to uh, our experiences. Um, however, in doing so, they frequently faced uh, the control of the discourse that I referenced earlier uh, to discover that they were depicted in Western art history as imitative or derivative. Now we're in a period, and it's interesting because the um, Gutai show just recently, 
curated, co-curated by my friend Ming Tianpo and Alexandra Monroe at the Guggenheim Museum, um, which just recently closed, uh, is proof that in many instances, the Gutai, who were working in Japan in the 50s and 60s, had actually anticipated things that were happening in the West. Uh, and they sought a connectiveness that I think was very important to any artist on the periphery, whether you're indigenous or not, if you're on the periphery, you're at a disadvantage. You can, be, by the way, be on the periphery in your own country as well. You're still at a disadvantage. Um, she also mentioned recoding and radicalism. She mentioned wakapapa, uh, which is an extended kind of genealogy, which has really to do with identity, I think. Um, and I found in her uh, slide of Michael Parakauhai's uh, carved piano, some of that overlay that I think Gerald mentioned, that fluidity, that, that, possible, that possibility for things to shape shift, if you like. And I was very struck by uh, that, your last quote when you talked about the tensions of biculturalism, because it has so much to do with those overlays uh, that Gerald is also, I think, mentioning. Uh, perhaps I'm, I'm riding rather freely with Gerald's notions, forgive me if I am, uh, but it's my word right now. <laughs> um, but I like this idea that you know, things are not static and that we can move around and that we can make connections and that we can change our positions as well. I think this is very important. So moving now to Venkat. Um, well, Venkat, your story is utterly personal. Uh, it's a story of hardship, but it's also a story of imagining possibilities. It's also a story that brings in genealogy and movement because it was important to you to find mentors, some of them in your family, some of them not, some of them by accident. Um, and you moved, you, you, you went to Bhopal and then to New Delhi and then you began to travel overseas. It's extraordinary to think that this kind of um, uh, motion, this, this natural motion of being able to get on a, a to walk or ride a bike or drive a car or get on a plane is accessible, is so much more accessible to us globally. You also worked in, with commissions, which is a long tradition in the West as well. One thinks of Michelangelo and Raphael, for example, just to sort of set the bar high. Um, but I found it interesting, especially when I went up to the exhibition, to see uh, your work in a more uh, uh, journalistic or repertorial guise. There you were registering the Mumbai terrors, but you were also registering in one terrific drawing at the end of the exhibition uh, upstairs, uh, your own struggle. And how do you do it? You do it in a grid, that quintessential modernist, uh, non-compositional, uh, non-hierarchical um, uh, way of setting out uh, information. So I very much enjoyed this, this, this zeroing in, uh, and I found many, many overlays and, um, and uh, echoes amongst uh, the group. But I want to talk I want to turn away now from the immediacy of, of the speakers, and I want to remind you, and thank you, Venkat, for having brought it up in your talk, about Les Magiciens de la Terre. Because I think that this kind of exhibition, which aims to be, uh, in my own words anyway, uh, inclusive, very broad ranging, uh, that embraces a global perspective, which doesn't mean that everything is here, but it means that its scope is wide. Uh, in a sense, this began in Paris in 1989 with the 100 artists who were included in that exhibition. And those artists were both indigenous artists and what's conventionally known as Western artists, for, for lack of a better term, I think. Um, there were a hundred of them. And I, this morning I was flipping through the catalog. I bought this catalog when Charlotte Townsend Galt and Robert Houle and I were curating, just beginning to curate um, Land Spirit Power. And I remember that in our incredible, um, I don't know if it's egotism, but I'll use that word because I can't think of another right now. Uh, we figured that Land Spirit Power would 
not fall into some of the traps that Les Magiciens de la Terre had fallen into. Whew. Um, Looking back on it, you know, it was a controversial exhibition. There was a definite resistance. I should remind you of that in case you think it was all honey and milk. Uh, it wasn't. There was a definite resistance uh, to that exhibition and it came from the Western art establishment, the Western art critics, who said you can't just bring all this work together just because it sort of resembles each other. Um, so I thought it would be interesting um, to look at what the criteria for that exhibition were uh, as they laid it out handily for me in their catalog. First of all, they visited all the artists. They went for their criteria to things that I would describe as uh, an attempt to get at uh, some shared essence. Now, I'm a feminist, and I understand, as well as I'm able, uh, the pitfalls of ideals, of ideas of essentialism. But essences are sometimes useful for us because they, they, they force us to shift our perspective from our critical, hmm, I don't think this belongs here, to what do we have in common. It's a little bit like labor negotiations. Um, so some of their other criteria were originality and, and inventiveness with respect to their cultural context. The, res the relationship of the artist to his or her environment, that is to say, the artist's situation with respect to their community should be apparent in the work. Uh, the artist's intention and desire should be revealed in the work. In other words, it should go beyond fabrication. It should go beyond what uh, Gerald, quoting Kandinsky, called the exterior form into the inner expression. The artist's energy should lead him or her to give radical expression to his or her ideas and embrace a sense of adventure. And they avoided, explicitly avoided, artists who drew their expression from the so-called primitivism of others. You know, the turn to indigenous art occurs at moments of crisis in Western art. It happened at the end of the 19th century. It happened again in the teens and 20s of the 20th century. And it also happened at the end of the 80s and the 90s when modernism was playing out its kind of last notes and postmodernism was coming in. So I think that, you know, when we look at how indigenous artists or any artists on the periphery overcome that tendency of the Western discourse to assert its power uh, and to um, accuse them of imitation or derivativeness. One of the things that postmodernism, for all its pitfalls, brings to us is an emphasis on cultural specificity and on the cultural part of the individual artist's work. And I think that this is one of those um, rather useful, uh, I'm not going to pretend that it's, it's the path, you know, uh, but I do think it could be a good little rabbit hole for us uh, because it allows us to move around and to, and to shift the perspective in what I think is an interesting way. I began by saying that this exhibition for me is a kind of, um, you know, the serpent eating its tail, the buckling the buckle, you know, all these, all these cir circular images. Well, they aren't really circular, are they? One of the things that we can do, because in the end, in the, in the global art world, we will be faced with the art market. The art market will make its brutal choices um, and they will not always be choices that will be to our advantage as individuals or as, you know, speaking from a curatorial perspective now, as champions of the artists that we believe strongly in. Um, and they won't always be to the advantage of countries like Canada or New Zealand or uh, India or Australia uh, or Taiwan, the countries that are so strongly represented in this exhibition. We are peripheral countries in terms of power. 
Uh, we are countries that are linked by histories of colonization, for example. But what we do in our own countries matters. And when Robert and Charlotte and I curated Land Spirit Power, we knew that we were making a difference. We were making a difference in Canada. We were making a difference at the National Gallery of Canada. The flame we lit at that point is something that was picked up here in this institution, as no doubt it has been in the institutions of other countries. I talked about that closed system, bureaucratic, cyclical motion. How do you change that? You know, you have to find some kind of entrance. And I think looking back on Land Spirit Power in 1992, um, we found a way. Uh, we opened a door. Uh, the door stayed open at the National Gallery. Um, the collection of Indigenous art has grown uh, exponentially. Um, it's broadened to include art from uh, by Indigenous artists from many other countries. And I think that this, this more radical, if I can call it that, or more political agenda is something that we embrace in our own countries where we make change. Um, in the big biennials and the big, in the big um, exhibitions internationally, the art fairs, etc., there too are openings, but they generally speaking are openings for certain individuals as, as opposed to collectivities. Uh, so the two things are happening at the same time. And we have these overlays and this motion and this zooming in and out uh, that the panelists have talked about. Um, and I'm very happy to have been a part of, of that process, which I trust is ongoing. Thank you very much.